Hello, this is Mary Kay, and I'm so glad that we could spend this time together today. There are some special things that I would like to share with you about my personal life and about our beginnings as a company. You know, it's hard for me to believe that 30 years have passed since we opened our doors. We've learned a lot through our successes and our failures, and along the way we've gathered many pearls of wisdom. And I'd like to share some of these stories of the heart with you, not as Chairman Emeritus of Mary Kay Cosmetics, but as a friend. Our company's history is intertwined with my own life, so in relating one, I'm really telling you the story of both. Our story is not about money or status or fame. I like to think of it as a story of two people, like a mother and a daughter on a mission. And it's also the story of many women whose lives our company has touched and whose lives have touched mine. It really is true that all you send into the lives of others comes back into your own. And watching women achieve their dreams is the thing that keeps me inspired. I see it every day in the letters that I receive from our consultants and directors, women who dared to dream of having a family and a career without sacrificing one for the other, women who traded tenure and titles and dead-end jobs and glass ceilings for something else, an opportunity that offered a happy, successful, and balanced life. In the early 60s, Opportunity just didn't exist for women, and I wanted with all my heart to give them the chance that I felt they so richly deserved. Some came into our company who had never written a check, and today some of these women earn more than the President of the United States. You know, it's been a good day for me when a woman with no sense of self-worth discovers how great her talent really is and then to watch her succeed, remembering that I knew her when, when she couldn't lead in silent prayer. And now she holds an entire convention center spellbound with her message. A woman who only dreamed of a better shift on a shotgun shell assembly line, achieving millionaire status in her Mary Kay career. And there are so many other Mary Kay success stories but they are not successes because of Mary Kay, but rather by the women who took the opportunity that we offered and determined their own destinies. And what thrills me even more is watching these women inspire other women to dream and to achieve more than they ever believed possible. And by becoming heroes and sheroes to each other, their goals were transformed by their actions, not mine. Women have proven time and again what I know to be true. Each one has special God-given talents and abilities. And given the chance, she can do anything she puts her mind to. If we can make a difference in just one woman's life each day, I feel very fortunate. There are so many women across the world who need what we have to offer. It's like the story about an old man and a young boy who were walking along a seashore. And every few steps, the young boy would reach down, pick up a starfish from the sand, and throw it back into the sea. And the old man finally asked, What are you doing, son? And the lad replied, Well, you see, sir, when the tide goes out, the starfish is exposed to the sun, and it will die unless it gets back to the sea. And the old man remarked, But, son, there are thousands of miles of coastline, how could you possibly make any difference? The boy stopped, picked up another starfish, sailed it out into the sea, and he said, well, I made a difference to that one. A friend of mine once said, Mary Kay Cosmetics was a divine accident looking for a place to happen. We didn't set the world on fire from the first day. Our road to success was always under construction. One of my favorite expressions is, we fail forward to success, and believe me, we did. I've said countless times, if we ever decide to compare knees, you'll find that I have the bloodiest ones in the room because I have fallen down and gotten up so many times in my life. 
Our company is very successful and well-known today because of consultants and directors and national sales directors and others. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart. All you send into the lives of others does indeed come back into your own. And I'd like to show you how true this is by sharing just a little bit of my own personal life so that you can see what God was dealing with and the story of our humble beginnings. I've always said that I'm just an ordinary person. I put on my pantyhose one leg at a time, just like you do. But it was that extraordinary determination that my mother instilled in me early in life that taught me that anything is possible if you want it badly enough and you're willing to pay the price. When I was seven years old, my daddy came home from the sanitarium. His tuberculosis had been arrested but not cured in the five years he had spent there. And he was bedridden and in need of a lot of tender, loving care. My mother was the sole support of our little family and she managed a restaurant in Houston, working 14 hours a day. It was not a job that paid well and undoubtedly she was paid less just because she was a woman. Somebody had to take care of daddy. And since my oldest sister and brother were grown and gone, it became my responsibility. I would come home from the second grade, clean house, and do my homework. And I enjoyed it, even though some of the things were hard for me at that age, like cooking, for example. Mother was a marvelous cook, but she couldn't be home to make our family dinner, so it was up to me. Now, at age seven, you can understand, I didn't know much about preparing a meal. If Daddy wanted chili or chicken or whatever for dinner, and I didn't know how to cook it, I would call my mother at work. And whenever I called her, she would find a way to make time for me and would patiently explain what it was I needed to know. I would say, Mother, hi, Daddy wants potato soup tonight. And she would say, potato soup? Okay, honey. First, get out that big pot that you used yesterday and take two potatoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She goes through every single step, one at a time, trying to think of everything I needed to know. Sometimes it seemed overwhelming, but when she was through with her instructions, she always would say, Honey, Mother knows you can do it. Our family situation made it necessary for me to do some things that most children aren't expected to do. I remember going downtown in Houston on a streetcar on Saturdays to buy my clothes. I went alone because my best friend wasn't allowed to go downtown on a streetcar without an adult. And Mother would give me a dollar and a half. Now remember, this was a long time ago when a little girl's dress was 60 cents and eggs were 19 cents a dozen. And I loved picking out a dress or a blouse. It was really the highlight of my week. The only problem I had was convincing the clerks that I was really allowed to make such decisions. And they would often demand, where's your mother? And I would give them the phone number where she worked and say, you can call her, she'll tell you it's all right. I loved those Saturday trips because after I finished my shopping, I went to Cress's, had a fermented cheese sandwich on toast and a Coke, and then I went to a movie. I think the meal was about 20 cents and the movie was perhaps 10. So for 30 cents, I had a wow of an afternoon. I do remember when I first started going downtown, I was a little anxious about catching the right streetcar and finding my way around. And then I remembered my mother saying, you can do it, honey. I must have heard those words a thousand times, and she always said them with total conviction. I realize now that she was probably just a little bit nervous herself about the responsibility she had placed on that little girl's shoulders, but you would never have known it to hear her. And as far as I was concerned, my mother knew I could do it. Her words became the theme of my childhood. In those early days in my little corner of the world, there wasn't very much for a girl to look forward to after high school, especially when you couldn't afford to go to college. So at 17, I married a promising young radio star. I thought he was a tremendous catch, sort of Houston's Elvis Presley at that time. By the time he left to serve in World War II, the marriage had become an unhappy one. And when he returned, he announced that he wanted a divorce. 
I felt like a complete failure as a woman, as a wife, and as a person. It was the lowest point of my life. I had three beautiful children, and now I was the sole financial and emotional support of our little family. Being a single parent is not the easiest thing in the world, but Ben and Marilyn and Richard depended on me, and I didn't have time to sit around and feel sorry for myself. I needed a job with flexible hours, so after searching, direct sales seemed to be a very good solution. In direct sales, I could be at home when my children needed me and still have the earnings potential. At that time, there were just few jobs for women with any potential at all, and the earnings were better than average. I started my direct sales career by selling books and then cookware and cleaning products and finally home decorating accessories. One company that I worked for was called Stanley Home Products. The first year I was there, two things happened at a company seminar in Dallas that set the tone for the rest of my career. It was a miracle I got to attend it all. I had to borrow the money from a friend who thought that money would be much better spent on shoes for my children. And I took cheese and crackers because I couldn't afford to go out and eat for the three days we were there. I sat on the back row and I watched a girl crown Queen Sales. They gave her a beautiful alligator bag. I wanted that bag with all my heart. And during the ceremony, somebody said, To be successful, hitch your wagon to a star. Oh, how I wanted to be like her. She was tall and skinny and black-headed and, well, I was the opposite. But I hitched my wagon to her star so hard, I know she must have felt it. My Stanley party average at that point was $7. And this girl was queen of sales, but I thought, what has she got that I can't have fixed? And then second, they said, get a railroad track to run on. They didn't have a consultant's guide like we do. And then they said, tell somebody what you're going to do. So I needed to share my goal with somebody, but not just anybody. So after it was over, I marched up to the front of that auditorium and told Frank Stanley Beveridge, the president of that company, my goal. Next year, I stated in no uncertain terms, I am going to be queen. He looked at me very sincerely and said, You know, somehow, I think you will. And those words changed my life. I've often tried to imagine what Frank Stanley Beveridge saw in that little girl in her only good dress and that awful hat. By the way, they laughed about that hat for ten years, and the worst part was that I didn't know about it for nine. He saw something in me that I didn't. Those five words, somehow I think you will, echoed through my mind all during that next year. Before I left, I asked the Queen of Sales if I could watch her put on a Stanley party, and she agreed, and I took 19 pages of notes. And guess what? The next year, I was named Queen of Sales, and many times after that. I loved my work in direct sales and I was able to provide a comfortable lifestyle for my little family. I was well paid for a woman and training women was my forte. One company that I worked for paid me 25000 a year to be their national training director. But the truth was that I was acting as national sales manager for about half of what that job was worth. Many times I was asked to take a man out on the road to train him and after six months of learning the business from me, he was brought back to Dallas and given twice my salary. And it really irked me when I was told these men earned more because they had families to support. Well, I had a family to support too, and it seemed to me that a woman's brains were worth only 50 cents on the dollar in a male-run corporation. I even had a seat on my last company's board, and I took my responsibility very seriously but I found my ideas often were not respected. It upset me to present a good marketing plan only to be dismissed with, oh, Mary Kay, you're thinking like a woman again. So what was wrong with thinking like a woman? I had some good ideas, but no one would take me seriously because I was in the wrong body. It was so frustrating. So in 1963, after 25 years in direct sales, I retired for a whole month, that is. 
And during that month, I sat at my dining room table trying to write a book that would help other women over some of the obstacles that I had encountered in all those years. I also hoped this would be a positive way to help me to get over the resentment that I was feeling. I didn't know how to write a book, so I simply took a legal-sized pad and wrote down everything good that had happened in the companies I'd been with. And after a couple of weeks, I completed that list. Then I took a second legal-sized pad and began to write down all the problems that I had encountered, and there were many. One day it occurred to me if I was so brilliant, how would I have solved those problems had I had the opportunity and the responsibility? And I began to write down my solutions. When I read the whole thing, I realized that inadvertently I had put on paper a marketing plan that would indeed give women the opportunity that I wanted them to have. And the thought suddenly occurred to me, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody actually did this instead of just talking about it? And so I began to think about a dream company, one that would give women an open an opportunity to do anything they were smart enough to do. Then I needed a product. What could we use? Something that would appeal to women. And I finally settled on cosmetics because I knew that if a woman was going to sell something, she had to believe in it with all of her heart. And cosmetics seemed to be the perfect answer since most women feel they're experts in cosmetics by the age of 20. For years, I had been using some unusual products made by a woman that I had met at a Stanley party who sold them from her little home beauty shop in the wrong end of town. You know, when you get to the age of 40, you begin to try everything with those little lines start appearing. And the product had an interesting story. Her father had been a high tenor, and one day, when he was well past 50 years old, he noticed that the skin on his hands looked younger than the skin on his face, and that's not the usual way it is. In those days, there were no such things as rubber gloves, so he began to wonder about this unusual occurrence. He decided that the only possible explanation was the fact that he put his hands in these high tanning solutions day after day. So he began to experiment and put those same solutions on his face. After a number of years, he found he actually looked younger than before. He died at 73 without having done anything about his discovery. His daughter inherited the formula such as it was and became a cosmetologist. She spent 17 years getting it into a cream and lotion form that you and I might use. She died in 1961 and I felt that the only reason that she had not succeeded with this great product was she simply did not know how to market it. I was able to purchase formulations from her heirs, and I felt that with her product and the marketing skills that I had gained over 25 years in direct sales, that it could be a success. I was so excited, and with boundless enthusiasm, I went to my attorney to set up my dream company into a corporation. He very promptly sent to Washington for a pamphlet they told me how many cosmetic companies go broke every single morning just to encourage me. And as for the marketing plan, my accountant said that I couldn't give the commissions that I was proposing. I would go broke in six weeks. But my response to that was, I believe people will support that which they help to create. And I intended for this to be a company where our people would participate in the profits. He just shook his head in disbelief. In those days, it was impossible for a woman to go to a bank for a loan. They would have laughed me right straight out the front door. So I took my entire life savings of $5,000 and invested them in the formulations and the bottles and the jars and the literature and all the other things that were necessary to set up a company. From my 25 years of experience, I knew all about recruiting and training and motivation and the needs of a sales force, but I knew nothing of administration. I had married again, and my husband had that kind of expertise, so he was to be the administrator. He was the one to figure out what you had to buy something for and what you had to sell it for to keep from going broke in between. And when he tried to talk to me about the percentages, 
I didn't listen. I thought that was his problem. And when he discussed those things with me, it went in one ear and out the other. I was busy with what I considered to be the important things, the color of those jars and the writing of the sales manual and recruiting the people. Beauty by Mary Kay, that was our first company name, was about to be born. My dream company was about to become a reality. And then, one month to the day, before we were to open our doors as we sat at the breakfast table one morning, my husband died of a heart attack. I was in shock, and I was alone. But what do you do? The one thing I knew was that when God closes the door, he always opens a window. And that window came in the form of my 20-year-old son. Richard had two years of marketing at the University of North Texas and had recently married and moved to Houston. How would you like to turn your life savings over to your 20-year-old? And he had a job with a Prudential Life Insurance Company making $480 a month. I thought they were crazy to pay that kid all that money. The day of the funeral, my two sons and my daughter were there, of course, and a decision had to be made immediately about whether I was going to continue with my great idea because every single penny was either spent or committed. Richard said, Mother, I think you should do it. I will move to Dallas tomorrow to help you. I thought, big deal. Maybe Richard could pick up boxes I couldn't, or maybe he could fill an order. Of that, I wasn't really sure. But he was all I had, and I offered him $250 a month to come and help me. Ben, my other son, had always been my problem child. He was the kid you couldn't get up in the morning, and if you did, you couldn't get him dressed. And if you got him dressed and got his breakfast down him and sent him to school, they sent him home. But he said, Mother, I think you could do anything. And he reached into his breast pocket and pulled out a savings book containing $4,500 and said, Mother, I want you to have this for whatever you need. That's the day I forgave him for all the problems he had ever caused. And he also said, Mother, I would like to join you and Richard one of these days if I could. And I thought, heaven forbid. But sure enough, our business was growing and six months later, he joined Richard and me to be our warehouse manager. And my daughter Marilyn, with no training at all, took the very first beauty case and began selling in Houston. As for Richard, little did I know that he had an IBM brain and that just five years later, he would be awarded the American Marketing Association's Man of the Year Award. Today, he is recognized across the country as one of the young financial geniuses. And so our little company began in 1963 in 500 square feet of space and one little 995 Sears Roebuck shelf filled with one tier of cosmetics. In Exchange Park, an office building complex in Dallas, we opened our doors on Friday, September 13, 1963, exactly one month to the day after my husband died. You know, the 13th is usually known as a bad luck day, but for us, it was considered a lucky day. Richard and I had great hopes for this location. The Exchange Bank occupied the first floor of the building, and a number of national companies were tenants on the remaining floors. And over 5,000 women were employed in that building. And there were shops, including a coffee shop, a drugstore, and a restaurant, catering to the many women who worked in those different offices. And we figured we'd get lots of sales from that captive market. But we discovered that they went right past us on their way to work at five minutes to eight, and then they went right past us again on their way out every evening at five minutes to five. But we were located right next to the coffee shop, and they came down twice a day for coffee breaks. And we practically tripped them into our little cosmetic shop to give them a facial. We were giving the fastest 15-minute facials in the history of the world because we had to send them back upstairs in some kind of condition. I remember using an electric fan to dry the mask so we could hurry the facial along. And we needed something unusual to attract customers. And I thought of offering wigs. In 1963, wigs were a new idea to American women, and they were the very latest fad. And the wigs took up a lot of space in the back room, and the front room was decorated nicely because that's where we worked with our customers. But that left us no place to store our cosmetics. And so we rented a basement storage, and that solved that problem. 
But to get there, you had to go out in the mall, walk half a block, go down a long flight of stairs, and then walk another hundred yards in the basement to our little storage space. It amounted to being about two blocks away. Besides bookkeeping, Richard's job also included filling orders from the storage space. I always insisted that he dressed like a businessman, although even with his coat and tie, he still looked like a teenager. But he had lovely manners with the customers, and once a sale was made, he would take their order very formally and say, Yes, ma'am, I will be right back. As soon as he started down the stairs, he would start peeling off his coat. By the time he reached the door, he'd have his tie off, and then he'd run all the way to that storage area and put that order together. Then he would put his tie and his jacket back on, straighten his shoulders, and run back. By the time he walked in the showroom, he'd be just as dignified as you please. And then he would hand the customer the merchandise as if he were delivering it on a silver platter. A few years later, Richard declared, I've had it. I'm sick and tired of these wigs. We've got to get rid of them. Taking the wigs out of her line was a good decision. Our consultant zeroed in on the cosmetics, and the next month our sales soared. Daylene White was our very, very first consultant. She and eight other friends of mine joined me in the beginning, mostly because they didn't have the heart to say no. Daylene had worked for my husband, and she felt sorry for me. I'm certain that Daylene didn't intend to stay. I'm so glad she did. She even helped me to make and hang the very first curtains in our shop. There were others, of course, who didn't join us. With hindsight, you might say, well, didn't they make a mistake? But back then, everything was still experimental. In the beginning, I held skin care classes, too. But we soon discovered that people wondered why the owner of a company had to be out holding classes. You own this company, they'd say? and you're at my house doing a skincare class? Must be an awful small company. And they figured if the company was so small, the products couldn't be any good either. And so I had to work through our consultants, giving them ideas to try. And little by little, we refined our techniques. We had been in business only a year, and we were expanding so rapidly that we needed more office space. We moved to 1220 Majesty Drive, and now we had three offices, one for me, one for Richard, and one for Ben. We also had a training room and a huge warehouse, 5,000 square feet in all. We were growing so fast it was hard for us to believe it. On September 13, 1964, a year after we'd opened, we held our first major meeting. We called it seminar because it was to be an educational event along with recognition. We couldn't afford to rent space in the hotel, so we held that first seminar in the warehouse of our new location. I still remember how enthusiastic we all were. We decorated the warehouse with crepe paper and balloons so it would look really festive. We had a cake that said, Happy First Anniversary and a three-piece band. And the menu was simple, chicken with jalapeno dressing and jello salad. Those little paper plates we used were flimsy and you couldn't cut a thing on them. So I had to bone all the chicken for 200 people. I haven't liked chicken since. The huge orange jello salad had lots of good stuff in it, but I didn't stop to consider that Texas wasn't all that cool in September, and that jello melted all over the place. After dinner, I acted as master of ceremonies, and we held our first annual awards Remember night. Three steps I told you about that are necessary for you to plan your work and work your plan. First of all, hitch your wagon to some star who walks across the stage tonight. There will be it was really very modest compared to what we do today, but we were all thrilled. It was a year after our opening, and there were by now 200 of us. We were on our way. We grew from one seminar to the next, and now we have over 32,000 women who come to Dallas each summer for seminar. Sometimes I wonder... If my mother was aware of the seeds she was planting in my life as a child and where they would take not only me but thousands of other women, what she sent into my life, I sent into others, and they in turn have sent what they have into many lives as well. 
The seeds planted in 1963 have flourished and been nourished by thousands of women. Those who went beyond the bounds of what their peers expected, what their families expected, or even what they expected of themselves. And today, 30 years later, we still have as the mainstay of our business the five basic steps of skin care. And our research and development departments have been able to broaden the formulas to include every skin type. When I think of all these innovations and our exciting plans for the future, my pride knows no bounds. I marvel that our space requirements have grown from a mere 500 square feet to over a million square feet of space. And we've gone from Mary Who to a brand of cosmetics that has the most loyal customers in the cosmetic world. Our directors throughout the country hold over 5,000 training sessions each week. And with Richard's guidance and the help of many others, our marketing plan has changed the reputation of direct selling. That first year, we had hoped to make a living as we helped women help themselves, listening to their ideas and teaching them proper skin care. I never dreamed that three decades later, we would have Mary Kay consultants in foreign countries all over the world. Australia was our very first international subsidiary, and we've grown from one country to the next. It amazes me to see people in places like Thailand, Argentina, and Taiwan getting excited about Mary Kay and the difference it's made in their lives. And how exciting it was just one month after the unification of Germany when 18 women walked across our seminar stage as Mary Kay consultants from East Germany with tears of grateful joy streaming down their faces. One of those women took the microphone and said, First we get freedom and then we get to Mary Kay. The emotion of those words moved the entire hall which exploded into supportive applause for these women embarking on a new life journey. The idea of giving women an open-end opportunity has catapulted countless thousands to achieve their dreams, and now women of many cultures are accepting our opportunity in their own countries. Someone once asked me, Mary Kay, do you realize that on any given day, at any given hour, a skin care class is being held somewhere in the world. Remember the starfish story? You can make a difference. I still get excited when I see somebody on an airplane using one of our products. And it made my day when I heard recently that one of our directors had just made a skin care appointment with the governor of her state. And the First Lady of the United States has read my books and that Hollywood has portrayed a Mary Kay beauty consultant in a major film. All you send into the lives of others truly does come back into your own. We're living proof of that. In fact, several of the nine original consultants are still with the company. Remember Daylene, the one who helped me open our doors? She's now a national sales director in our company. And she and Helen McBoy, another national sales director who recently retired, became our very first Mary Kay millionaires, each earning more than $1 million in commissions during their Mary Kay careers. And now they are both multi-millionaires. Over the years, we have built so many traditions. And in our next visit, I'd like to share with you how some of these came to be, for instance, the power of pink and diamond bees and the go-give spirit. But for now, I'd like to leave you with a story about a little girl in Philadelphia named Hattie who made a difference in the lives of the people in her community. The story goes like this. A local minister started a Sunday school program for the neighborhood children. And Hattie came to that very first meeting because the room was very small, several children had to be turned away. And Hattie went to bed sad that night because many of her playmates couldn't attend Sunday school. It was just not enough room. Two years later, Hattie died. 
her parents sent for their minister and gave him a worn red pocketbook that they had found beneath Hattie's pillow. The pocketbook contained 57 pennies that she had earned by running errands. And with the money was a note in Hattie's handwriting that read, This is to build the church bigger so more children can come to Sunday school. The Sunday following Hattie's funeral, the minister carried the little red pocketbook into the pulpit, and he took out the 57 pennies, and he dropped them one by one back into the purse. And he told how Hattie had given all she had, and the congregation was touched. After the service, a visitor came forward and offered a piece of desirable land for a new church building. And he said, I will let the church have it for the price of 57 pennies. When this story hit the news, checks began coming in from everywhere. And today, visitors are impressed with the Temple Baptist Church in Philadelphia, seating capacity 3,300. And it all began with a little girl who wanted to help. What a difference she made. A paraphrase of Edward Everett Hale's famous quotation goes like this. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. I will make a difference. And I encourage you to make a difference in the lives of others every single day. God bless you.